didn't even work very good, uh, but they're very expensive. And so we're going to be able to do or propose a permanent exemption on sales tax for all cribs and strollers. And so that's going to help families be able to afford. We're also going to do a, a full year sales tax exemption for children's books. We want to do a full year sales tax exemption uh, for children's toys up to up to 12 years old. Uh, we also want to do a full year uh, sales tax exemption on all household items, $25 or less. And so the things you lose around your house, under 25, tax free. And that's each individual item. So if you buy $500 worth of stuff, every single thing that's under 25 is tax-free. So that could be pretty significant uh, for folks, particularly people that have to have, you know, that have big families and they got to they got to look after the household. We're doing one-year sales tax exemption uh, for all athletic equipment for for under 18. And so little league, we're in t-ball, all this stuff that'll be tax exempt, and we're happy with that. And as much as we understand how important it is for families raising children, uh, we also understand that for a lot of families, uh, it's not just the, the children that they look after, it's also their pets that they look after. And so we are going to be able to do and propose a one-year sales tax exemption on all pet food, and that's going to make a big difference. <laughs> We're also going to propose a permanent sales tax exemption uh, for over-the-counter pet medications. And right now, uh, similar to like humans, if you get prescribed something for your pet, that is not taxable. But if it's simply something you get over-the-counter, you're paying sales tax on that. And so we want to make sure that that is tax-exempt, just like the prescription medications are. So that, I think, will make a big difference for folks. And just like the strollers and everything with babies and how expensive, you know, pets are expensive, too. There's just a lot that goes into it. And so if we can lessen that burden, I think that's really, really good. Uh, we're also going to expand our back-to-school sales tax holidays. And so we've always done one, but this, this time we're going to do a total of four weeks. We're going to do two leading into the fall semester and then two for the spring semester as well. And so that will give families more bites at the apple. We also want to propose a permanent exemption of sales tax on all medical supplies and equipment. Uh, we saw with COVID, people needing to buy things, uh, that should be tax free. And then all the tax holidays we did this year, fiscal year, we want to reestablish those. And so there's things like the, the outdoor tax uh, break where you buy the outdoor stuff. I think we call it the Freedom Week. Uh, we had other things that I think are really, really good. So this is the most robust package. This is $1.1 billion, just what I announced here. Then you look at the toll relief, which is between $400 and $500 million, and we're not done yet. We're actually going to do more proposals, and so stay tuned for that. And I would also point uh, folks to, with, and I supported with the legislature, uh, putting some of these initiatives on the ballot uh, for some property tax relief for our first responders and nurses and teachers. So that is going to be there, and I think it will likely pass. So this is really, really good to say in the state of Florida, we respect you as taxpayers, and we're going to work to lessen the burden on you, and we're going to make sure we run our ship in a really tight fashion. And obviously, when you have the biggest budget surplus in history of the state by far, you know that you're doing that, and so let's return some of that. Now look, we have the biggest rainy day fund we've ever had. I think it's like $3.2 billion now. It was $1.5 billion when I became governor, and that's important. I also think just because of what we're dealing with with the Biden economy, as bad as the inflation has been and as much as energy has cost people, the Fed is keeping to raise interest rates. And that, I think, is going to continue to put a drag on the economy. Florida will do better than the average state in the country because we've got a lot of stuff going on. But you can't be immune to this. You know, we're a national economy as well. So I'm concerned about some of the turmoil that's yet to come. 
And I hope that that doesn't come to pass, but I don't think you can look at what's going on in Washington and think that somehow we're going to come out of this uh, as a country uh, without seeing any more economic turmoil. And so because we have such a big surplus, not only do we have the budget stabilization, our rainy day fund, you know, we're going to have billions and billions of dollars that we can set aside for additional if we have economic turmoil because of the Biden policies. And so I think when you talk about infrastructure, education, natural environment, all the great things that we've been able to do, and I think we've done record. We did record school funding, largest teacher pay increase in Florida history. We did record funding for our natural resources and our environment, record Department of Transportation work program budget. So we're doing all those things, but we're also going to have not just the budget stabilization, we're going to have other money Money that if you have issues, if there's more dislocation, if there's more turmoil, uh, all those other things, we're going to keep going. Just move some money from the from the kitty and put it in, and we're not going to miss a beat on any of that stuff. And so we're really positioned well. Uh, we feel like we're positioned really good, and so we can do this tax relief really without breaking a sweat at this point. So we're going to do it, and we're going to deliver for the uh, people of the state more than we ever have before. All right, I want to hear. I want, to, I want you guys to hear from, from our folks here, so we'll start uh, with Dane Eagle, uh, Department of Economic Opportunity. Well, thank you all. This is an exciting announcement this morning. Our job at DEO is to assist the governor with advancing the economy, and the truth of the matter is Florida is outperforming the nation in almost every measure. Governor announced 2.7 percent unemployment compared to the nation at 3.7 percent. We have more jobs, more workers here in the uh, in the state of Florida than we did pre-pandemic, and that's because of the governor's freedom first policies. People are choosing to come to Florida for hope and opportunity. But the truth is they can come here and they are going to be better off, but they cannot escape uh, the effects of the federal government and Biden inflation. Uh, we, in, we in Florida as Floridians are not immune to it. What the governor is proposing today is to help with the fiscal uh, impacts that happens to Florida's families due to federal spending and federal inflation. Inflation, and uh, this is monumental. As a parent myself, the governor mentioned a lot of this is coming from his own experience as a young father. We both have two-year-olds and diapers. Uh, that's huge. These are things you don't experience until you are a parent and you realize these are real costs that you have to live with on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Uh, now our kids are both two. By the time this goes into effect, oh, let's hope, knock on wood, they're not in diapers anymore. and we, we won't benefit from it. But the reality is Floridians will and Floridians need this, and this is incredible. I do have a golden retriever, so, Governor, I will benefit from the <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, the food for uh, for dogs because that's uh, that's important too. Uh, this is exciting. This is uh, monumental for Floridians as we continue to lead the nation in economic recovery. Here's one more example of how Floridians are going to benefit better than other states of the nation. We look forward to working with the legislature to make it happen. And I'm excited to hear from the families behind us. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. All right, we'll we'll hear from Alicia, then we'll hear from Nick. So come on up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Klavonik and I live in Venice, Florida. I am a registered nurse currently working a contract nurse assignment at a local hospital system. My husband is a firefighter EMT. We have two children, a three and a half year old and a 15 month old daughter. We recently moved here from North Carolina after living through the travesty of the COVID lockdowns and we are so happy to be back in my home state where I grew up. I'm here today because the governor proposed a tax relief that will benefit my family and families like mine across the state. With that, with what I'm earning, I feel like I should be giving my family all the luxuries of life along with their basic needs. My husband and I both have great paying jobs, but with all the costs exploding, we aren't getting ahead and we constantly are having to watch our budgets. We already shop at Aldi and buy Aldi brand diapers for my 15 month old who luckily can tolerate the generic brands. Yet even there we're starting to see significant price increases. I don't know what we would do if we had to buy Pampers or Huggies, which a lot of families have to buy, you know, name brand products. So this inflation crisis is just so challenging for all of us young families. If I go to Walmart or Publix, it's at least $300 a week for our family and just groceries and I'm not buying filet mignon. I am just trying to provide food for my family. Like any mom, you know how fast kids grow. Means more clothes, 
more shoes, more food, more diapers, and all the essential needs small children have. We are constantly buying to meet their basic needs, and all of that adds up so fast. Getting relief and even just small amounts on things we absolutely cannot live without will add up just as fast. And that gives me some peace of mind knowing that help is on the way. So thank you, Governor, for caring about families like mine and helping us. Thank you. Okay, Nick Burrows. Hi, my name is Nick Burrows and this is my wife, Elizabeth. And today we're joined with our four biological and three adoptive children. And uh, we're glad to have a chance to share our story with you today. I'm a pilot and my wife is a homeschooling mom. And uh, you know, we live in Volusia County and we're just glad to be here to join you. Uh, having a large family was always a prayer of Elizabeth and I. We've been blessed with four healthy children. And uh, for most people, that'd be more than enough kids. Um, but God had a different plan in our life. And uh, in 2018, we became foster parents. And a little more than four years, we've had over 20 children cross uh, our threshold of our door. And uh, some needed a place just for the night, and while others needed a place for forever. Uh, the common denominator has been parents finding themselves in a time of need, and a need for community. And a safety net provided by their fellow citizens of Florida is foster care and foster parents. It's never easy, but God hasn't called us to do the easy. Foster parents and services provided by community-based care providers across the state are the last line of defense for these families. As you can imagine, the critical role that foster parents play hasn't gotten easier in the last few years. These vulnerable families, especially their children, must remain our state's priority. And though these tax and through these tax initiatives, Florida recognizes the vital contribution that foster families such as ours make in strengthening our communities. Everyday staples like milk, bread, gasoline, formula, and diapers haven't gotten cheaper, and therefore the purchasing power of our foster parents has been decreased, leaving the most vulnerable in our community struggling. As a family, we felt that pressure firsthand and continue to see the challenges being posed by inflation throughout the foster community. Our grocery bill alone has gone from 750 to well over $1,000 a month in the last six months. We drive a 15-passenger van that gets 13 miles to a gallon because our family is the only vehicle that can accommodate our family. We're grateful to be able to weather this storm and still provide a little extra to those in need, but it truly brings into stark relief every dollar counts for families that are on the margins. Any way to make those dollars go further is critical in ensuring that we protect these kids and stand with our foster communities. These significant initiatives remind us that we aren't alone when that phone rings in the middle of the night, that we stand on a mission of love for children backed by Floridians who have made families and children their priority. We appreciate the governor's efforts to make cost of everyday items a little more affordable and families like ours and so many foster families across the state that fight for our foster kids. Thank you, Governor. Thanks. Part of the reason we're also able to do uh, the tax relief we already did, but, but uh, an even more ambitious program was because when I did the budget, you know, I used the line item veto to save money for people because you know, the, the legislature can pass and I sign the budget, but I can also take projects out. So before I became governor, I think the record for most line item vetoes in a year was about $800 million. And I, I broke that record uh, 2020 with a billion dollars in vetoes. Last year we did... Um, yeah, they're clapping. All right, I remember. I saw <laughs> Bill. I didn't do. It. <laughs> I was very easy on Bill his first year uh, uh, when I, when he was leader and so president. But um, and then 2021, it had been a, we set the record billion. Then we did 1.5 billion. So that's a 50 percent increase in record. But this year, even though we were flush with revenue, I also knew the storms with with the Biden policies. I knew that there's going to be other things we need to do. So I had inherited a record of $800 million in vetoes. We did $3.1 billion in vetoes. So. And
and now we're really well positioned. But we've done a lot for you guys, so I, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, there's some things in there. There's some things are must have, some things you shouldn't have, and then some things may be nice to have, and you just got to make the decisions on those nice to have ones. Uh, sometimes you you pull the trigger, but sometimes you say maybe uh, maybe not. So, uh, anything else we can do for you? Can we bring any more uh, any more support? We're looking forward to doing it. <laughs> All right, anybody? Yes. So when Biden is flying these people all over the fruited plain in the middle of the night, I didn't hear a peep out of those people, okay? I didn't hear a peep. I haven't heard a peep about all the people that have been told by Biden you can just come in and they're going, they're being abused by the cartels, they're drowning in the Rio Grande. You had 50 that died in some shed in Texas. I heard no outrage about any of that. Uh, I haven't heard outrage about all the fentanyl that's come across the border that's killing Americans in record numbers. I don't hear... I don't hear outrage about the criminal aliens that have gotten through and have then victimized people, not only in Florida, but all throughout the country. I didn't hear any outrage about that. The only thing I hear them getting upset about is you have 50 that end up in Martha's Vineyard. Then they get really upset. And I'm sorry. Those migrants were being treated horribly by Biden. They were hungry, homeless. They had no, no opportunity at all. The state of Florida, it was volunteer, offered transport to sanctuary jurisdictions because it's our view that, one, the border should be secured. And we want to have Biden reinstitute policies like remain in Mexico and making sure that people aren't overwhelming. But short of that, if you believe in open borders, then it's the sanctuary jurisdictions that should have to bear the brunt of the open borders. So that's what we're doing. But what happened was they were, they were provided um, an ability to be in the, the most posh sanctuary jurisdiction maybe in the world. And obviously it's sad that Martha's Vineyard people deported them the next day. They could have absorbed this. They chose not to. But what it shows is if 50 was a burden on one of the richest places in our country, what about all these other communities that have been overrun with hundreds or thousands? It shows you when now these policies are on the front burner People need to be talking about. Biden can't defend his policies of open borders. Uh, it's doing huge damage uh, to our country. It's costing a lot of money. It's costing lives with the drugs that are pouring across. And so the question is, is why are you supporting Biden's policies? Why don't you step up and tell him you're failing and let's do it differently? Because you know what? He inherited a border that wasn't like this. He has created the crisis. But now at least we know nobody can deny that there's a crisis. Everybody now knows. And it was only because you had to have the elite who want to have the cost on everybody else and they don't want to have to shoulder that. That's the only reason now people are talking about this. Well, I would say read, I would tell them to read Florida statutes. We are required to teach slavery, the post-reconstruction and segregation, civil rights. Those are core parts of American history that should be taught. 
but it should also be taught accurately. For example, the 1619 Project is a CRT version of history. It's uh, supported by the New York Times. They want to teach our kids that the American Revolution was fought to protect slavery. And that's false. We know why the American Revolution was fought. They wrote pamphlets. We saw them dump tea into the Boston Harbor. We saw them meet in Philadelphia. And we have the records of why they revolted against King George III. And so it was the American Revolution that caused people to question slavery. No one had questioned it before we decided as Americans that we are endowed by our creator with unalienable rights and that we are all created equal. Then that birth abolition movements. So you can't teach history that's being used to pursue an ideological agenda. You can't teach uh, that the foundations of our country uh, were somehow evil. Our, our founders pledged their lives, fortune, sacred honor, and they put a marker in the sand. Not everything lived up to it right away, of course not, but every major movement in our country's history has gone right back to those core principles. So we want to teach history, all history. It's got to be accurate, though, and we are not going to be in a situation um, where we're taking George Washington's name off schools, taking down statues of Thomas Jefferson, and that's what those people who want see CRT want to do. They want to change history. They want to delegitimize these folks, um, and that's not what we're doing. But don't let anyone tell you we don't want those subjects taught, because not only do we want it, we have it in statute that they must be taught. I cannot confirm that. I can't. Well, we, we, we do do both. So, so we've had interdiction in the panhandle. The problem is, is we're not seeing mass movements of them into Florida. So you end up with a car with maybe two. And if we know that that's illegal and there's someone that's kind of smuggling, then, then committing crime, then you can do arrest. There have been drug seizures. But that's not effective enough to stop the mass migration, but it's just coming in onesie twosies. So we've had people on the border for last summer, we've done a lot of intelligence, and everyone down there will say between a third and 40% of the people coming across uh, are seeking to end up in Florida. And so we have to go and figure out, okay, who are those people likely to be? Uh, and if you can do it at the source and divert to sanctuary jurisdictions, the chance they end up in Florida is much less. And the thing is with the sanctuary, the, the idea is, is because they have more benefits or whatever they do, that people will, will be able to stick. And so that's why you're doing it. If, if I could do it all in Florida, I would. But if we just ignore the source, then you're going to have people trickling in 5, 10 a day, 20 a day. I don't know. But there's no way you can possibly track all of that because it's on such a small scale. Whereas if you know there's a, maybe a 1,000 people down there and a lot of them say in Florida, well, you could say, well, hey, wait a minute. Here's a sanctuary jurisdiction. Be able to provide the transport. So if that's what you want to do, you do. And I think that that's much more effective than um, than just trying to send one or two out um, at a time. Also point out, you know, there's we have a whole infrastructure in place now because of what the legislature did. So it's not just flights. You know, we have ground. We have other things um, that, that we can do. And I'll tell you this, uh, it's already made more of an impact than anyone thought it could possibly make. Uh, but we're going to continue to make more of an impact. And I think that at, at the end of the day, what we're doing uh, is not the ultimate solution. I think it's opening people's eyes to the solution, which is let's have a secure border. Let's have remain in Mexico. Let's take the cartels seriously and let's get with the program here. What they have been doing for a year and a half or more than that is basically ignoring that the problem exists. And I know a lot of the national corporate press doesn't like to talk about it, uh, but the reality is when you have the vice president saying there's no border crisis, when we've had millions of people come across illegally, uh, you've got to be kidding me. So let's get, let's get going. Let's get this thing secured. I, unfortunately, I don't think they're going to do anything in the immediate. Uh, it will be a big issue in the elections, I can tell you that. Uh, but hopefully when we get through with that, that we can have some rationality. If we have a new Congress, you know, that may be a big step in the right direction. But this is not an example of, hey, you know, he tried his best and just didn't work. This was an intentional 
policy to reverse policies that were effective. And you want to talk about, they'll say like, oh, you know, sending a bus from Texas is a stunt, all this. The biggest stunt was Biden coming in as president and reversing Trump's policies just so he could virtue signal that he was against Trump. It didn't matter that the policy had worked. He had to be anti, and so that's why he did it. So he did what the impact would be, and the impact has been devastating. I really hope more people will start to cover uh, the destruction we're seeing with the fentanyl crisis. I mean, we put a lot of emphasis on it uh, be when I became governor. COVID obviously made it more difficult. But what's making it almost impossible is the sheer volume of this stuff that's been pouring into the United States. And I'll run into uh, mothers, and it's so tragic because these kids are not making like really horrible decisions. Maybe they do one or two things wrong, but the fentanyl is so deadly that they'll overdose and some of them will die. So this is a huge, huge issue, and it's affecting American communities all across the United States. And I also think when you have things like criminal aliens that have been let in, you know, Maduro, the reports are Maduro is releasing people from his prisons and sending them up to the southern border. And you know you, these, these leftist dictators have done that in the past. So you're bringing in people, they're coming right across the border, and then they're going in the interior of the country, that's not going to be good for safety in our communities. I mean, that's going to be a big problem. And we already know that you've had uh, people that have been victimized by criminal aliens who've gotten across the border. And the reason why those crimes are so difficult to stomach is because if the federal government had just done its job, the crime would not have happened and the person would not have been victimized. So this is something that's really important. And these are things that people need to start talking about. And I think what also with Martha's Vineyard showed is the very wealthy community, 50, not a lot, uh, and they said they couldn't accommodate. And let's just take them at our word and say maybe that's true. If the wealthiest island, one of the wealthiest in America, can't accommodate 50, then you're looking at all these other communities and they're just supposed to accommodate all this more. So I think what it's shown is when you have the sheer numbers of people coming across illegally, even take out the criminal aliens, just the sheer numbers, you know, that has huge stress on the communities. And I remember last summer going down to the border and it was bad, but it's gotten a lot worse. This year is the worst year uh, that I think we've ever had in modern American history. So, so this is a big thing. Yes, sir. Right. I see a lot of grandparents in here. Yeah. Um, I have I have a situation in my own life where I'm just, you know, helpless on being a grandparent and supporting my grandchildren where we got small kids in the DCF program. What can we do about that? You guys, um, I think, have done some stuff with the grandparents in the legislature. So, you know, talk to these folks, because I know that's been an issue we worked on. So you do have the issue of, like, you know, visitation, custody, all that. Very important. Uh, we also have issues of understanding that in Florida, grandparents are really involved uh, a lot of times with their grandkids, because if the parents live out of state, you know they're going to visit their grandparents in Florida, no problem. What we've been able to do is say that, for the purposes of in-state tuition, that grandparents' residency counts uh, for students to get in-state tuition. And I think that's a really great idea. And, and it recognizes really the crucial role that so many of our seniors are playing uh, in the lives of our younger generation. And I would also remind you, since I've been governor, tuition at our state universities has not gone up one cent. We say you can't raise it. Make do with what you got. And so now the average tuition in Florida, I think it's like $6,200 to go to school, university, in state. And that includes UF, which is now number five in the country for public universities. We get them number five in the football rankings again, then we'll be where we need to be. But um, Florida State is in the top 20. And so you've seen these are high quality educations that you can get. Uh, without having to go $100,000 in debt. And so when you talk about Biden inflation, you talk about all these things, one of the biggest inflations we've had over the last generation has been college tuition. And I'm half proud to say we've, uh, we've held the line on that in Florida. You need to be able to deliver a good education for people in ways that they can go through college without being deep into debt. This debt 
that the co and the colleges have really benefited from it because they raise tuition. They take the kids have to take out more loans, and then if they stay five or six years, that's even better for the colleges because they can make more on tuition. And then a lot of these students are saddled with debt. And what ends up happening when they get out? They end up having tough job, tough time finding you know really high level employment because the degree was really uh, not worth the money that they put into it. So in Florida, we're going a much different direction. We want affordability combined with high quality, and that goes for our in-state residents, but also for our in-state grandparents. So, all right, guys, thanks so much. Appreciate it.